we have a very exciting speaker today who will speak to us about something more pleasurable than politics or social pandemic. To start with, I'm hosting, I'm hosting this event not because there is no one else available, but I have a particular interest in the topic that Dr. Batyuk is going to speak to us today. When I first arrived in Toronto, almost 60 or six decades ago, I learned that we have a very well-known wine growing area very close by. But coming from India with a Hindu background, I couldn't just delve into this enterprise without having some second thoughts. For me to delve into the um, subject or testing wines would have been considered too hedonistic from a Hindu background. The only way I could do it would be to take a scientific approach to the subject. But you didn't come to, for this meeting to hear me, but to listen to Dr. Stephen Batiuk, who has managed to combine his scholarship in archaeology of Western Asia and Eastern Mediterranean with, while delving into the history of winemaking practice in that region. More specifically, how human beings, how human migration in that region also spread winemaking practice way back in 10th century BCE. Stephen earned his PhD at U of T and is currently a senior research associate and lecturer in the Department of Near and Middle East Eastern Civilizations. He has also published extensively on the subject of archaeology of the region. Also happens to be a co-director of the Gora Regional Archaeological Project Expedition, acronymed GRAP. Speak of mixing business with pleasure. So here is Dr. Batuk to talk to us about the history of winemaking from prehistoric times to the present. Dr. Batuk. Thank you very much. Let me just get the screen shared. All right, I believe you see my screen and there we go. Do we, do you all see my presentation? Yes. Yes. All right. Well, thank you very much for this invitation to, uh, to speak uh, in these interesting times uh, where I'm sure probably after last night, many of us will probably need a glass or two of wine. Uh, right away, I'm going to apologize where I live. I'm awfully close to the trains. And so every once in a while, you might hear the door, dull roar of a train going by. Uh, I might have to stop to let it go. I apologize for that, but uh, such as doing these things from home nowadays. So, <clears throat> yes, so much of the stuff in our lives we really take for granted without really thinking about where they come from, what their backstory might be, or what effect they might have actually had on history and culture through time. Now wine, I would argue, is one such thing. It's been a prime mover in human civilization, both in the sacred and in the profane. Uh, it's, when one thinks of something like wine, it immediately invokes linkages to specific cultures like France, Italy, Spain. Uh, and it's something that if you look take the bigger picture of, of history, it's something that pretty much every culture partakes of or has partaken of at one point in their history. It's often tied to concepts of luxury and joie de vie. Wine played an important role in ancient societies as it continues to do so even today. 
But what exactly is the history of this illustrious beverage? Uh, the history of wine is actually obviously quite old, otherwise you wouldn't be sitting here listening to me. Uh, most people understand that the Greeks brought their wines to Italy and the Romans brought their wines to the Gauls. Marseille was one of the first French regions to be introduced to Roman vines themselves. Although a lot of history is sort of lost in that mix. You know, many, many forget or don't know that the Phoenicians were actually the ones who brought vineyards to North Africa, Sardinia, and Spain, and they were selling uh, wine to the south of France before the, uh, the, the Greeks and the Romans. Nowadays, of course, countries like the USA, Canada, South Africa, South America, Australia, now more and more thanks to climate change, Northern Europe and China are increasing their wine production, but of course, consumption as well. The question is how much further back can we push the history? Well, when you dig through Judeo-Christian culture, you already have hints of the greater antiquity of wine. And of course, you go to the Bible, uh, and one, of the, one of the first things that Noah did after the Great Flood was he planted a vineyard on Mount Ararat. Now keep in mind that Mount Ararat is in sort of eastern Anatolia and the Caucasus, right on the border between Armenia and Turkey. And first thing he did was make wine and proceed to get quite drunk. So drunk that he passes out naked in front of his tent and is seen by his son Ham. And when Noah realizes that his son has seen him naked, he is... He's full of shame and anger, and he curses, oddly enough, Ham's son, Canaan. Now, what's interesting is that the theme and geography in many ancient, uh, sorry, the theme and geography is paralleled in many ancient cultures, where you have this hero, such as uh, Noah or Utapishtum, Atrahasis, in, 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 Mes or in Ziusudra, in Mesopotamian stories. And they're, they, they survive a flood that has been sent by the gods, and and their boat lands on a mountain uh, in, in, in the old Babylonian version, Mount Nisir is, is where it is. And, and these mountains appear to be at the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. So in Eastern Anatolia and Caucasia. And one of the first things that's ever sort of discovered or planted are grapes and wine is usually made. Uh, one of my more favorite stories is the Iranian uh, story of the discovery of wine. It's slightly different than the others. You have uh, Jamshid, who's a mythological Iranian king known from the Avestan text, and he's the one that's credited with discover the discovery of fermentation and specifically that of wine. <laughs> and it's just a very cute story. Now, apparently he loved eating grapes so much. He, he had a large collection in storerooms in his palace. And one day he, he had a little hankering for some grapes and he sent his servants down to go collect some from him. And when they got into the storerooms, they were overcome, pass out and almost die. Sort of the idea is that perhaps from the CO2 that was locked in the room from the fermentation process. The grapes were then deemed poisonous and the room was locked. Now, there are two versions of the story, how it sort of finishes off. Either in one, one of his harem girls is basically despondent and suicidal because either of a chronic headache or because she was rejected by the king. Either way, she decides that she's going to commit suicide by drinking this poison that was stored in the, in the basement storeroom. Uh, she goes down, breaks in, drinks, and gets drunk instead. Freed of her depression, she introduces the, the drink to the king, who immediately falls in love with this newly discovered beverage that comes from his favorite fruit. Such is the mythology, though. What, what are the actual facts? Um, well, there aren't a lot, but there are a lot of hypotheses. And one of the, the main one that's really been uh, pushed around lately is the, what we call the Paleolithic hypothesis. Uh, it's been pushed a lot by Patrick McGovern, uh, who really sort of, I, I describe him as the godfather of all things ancient alcohol. If you, if you really want to learn more about the subject, he's got numerous books and they're very accessible, he's easy to read uh, for, for the non-specialist. But Pat's idea is that the discovery of fermentation of, well, specifically of grapes, was basically an accident of hunter-gathering society. And what you have to understand is that the yeast that's necessary for the fermentation is found naturally on berries. Yeast can be, the yeast can be found anywhere in the environment, but it tends to grow naturally on grapes. And so fermentation would have been spontaneously or naturally happening all the time. 
And the idea is that, well, humans would have observed animals such as birds who've been snacking on sort of fermenting berries on, on, the, on the vine or on the ground or something like that, you know, flying around oddly or falling out of trees onto the ground. And humans being humans would decide to test what they were eating. And they would have discovered the sort of deleterious effects is the idea. Or the other possibility is that they, they had collected fruit in some sort of perishable container, like something that's made out of wood or even stone containers. And they probably would have been crushed under their own weight. Juice would have sat collected at the bottom and it would have fermented naturally and formed wine. Humans being humans, of course, they get to the bottom of whatever this vessel is. They look and see this stuff and they decide, I'm gonna drink that and would have discovered its sort of intoxicating characteristics. Eventually, the, the figuring out that if they squeeze it, they can make more of this fantastic liquid. Essentially, what you need to take away from this is that wine is natural. Really, it, it just wants to be made and would have been discovered you know, somewhere at any time, wherever grapes grow naturally. And therein lies the issue. The key to understanding the history of wine is understanding the indigenous environments of the plant in question. So where do grapes grow? Well, if you look at this map that you see here, you can sort of see the cross hatch section that covers a lot of the, uh, of the Mediterranean world and uh, the Near Eastern world. Uh, <clears throat> the wild grapevine, Vitis vinifera silvestris, it has a wide distribution across the Middle East and Mediterranean world. It's a surprisingly hardy plant. It can survive and thrive in many different environments. Uh, with somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 different varieties that can be found throughout to the entire world. They, of course, can be used to produce a dizzying array of products from, well, just simple table fruit, from syrups to vinegars, but of course, wines. Now, it would appear that the grape was domesticated several times in different regions. There, this is not the result of a single genius that spread. But based on the number of domesticated varieties present in the region, uh, of Caucasia that is, sorry, there are present, presently about, well, over 500 different varieties in the Republic of Georgia alone versus the whopping 23 indigenous varieties in that great and important wine country of France. Now, the importance of this number I'll sort of come back to in a, in a, in a few minutes. But because of the numbers, it's believed that grapes were first domesticated in Caucasia uh, in modern Georgia, Armenia, and Eastern Turkey. The question, of course, is when did they first start making wine with it? Now, our earliest evidence for ancient wine has another great Canadian connection. Uh, University of Toronto and Royal Ontario Museum had some excavations in uh, central western Iran uh, in, the, in the 70s at the site of Godin Tepe, headed up by the late T. Kyler Young. Now, the excavations revealed a town with a southern Mesopotamian entrepot. So it was a local town, but then attached to the side of it, as you can see in the slide here, is this round building. It was called the Oval. And the architecture was alien to the region, but it was perfectly perfect for southern Iraq. The pottery was perfect for southern Iraq. So this was people who had come up from Iraq into the Iranian highlands to facilitate trade down into the region. Uh, and in the excavations, they discovered a number of storage jars for liquids that produced this yellowish residue at the bottom of it. Now, it was because of this vessel that McGovern, in conjunction with a number of chemists, developed a test to look for the chemical signature that could be left behind from wine. They discovered that all these vessels that Godin produced evidence of tartaric acid, which showed that they had at one point contained grape liquid. But the presence of a terebinth, well, signature of a terebinth resin suggested that that liquid was wine. Essentially, what you're looking at here is the equivalent of a Greek ratsina, as the resin was used in ancient times as a stabilizing agent or preservative for these early wines. Later examinations by, by Pat of material from a Neolithic site called Haji Furuz Tepe, which you're seeing here in the slide here, uh, which is near Lake Wormia in sort of northwestern Europe. Run, it's dated between 5,400 and 5,000 BC, uh, produced similar evidence of this ancient scene, pushing production of wine back to the uh, very late part of the Neolithic period, so the transition between the Neolithic and the Chalcolithic. 
Now, in the 1970s, the Georgia National Museum and the Institute of Archaeology of the Georgia National Academy of Sciences instituted excavations at the site of Shulaveris Gora, which is near the modern town of Marneuli, just about an hour south of the capital city of Tbilisi. Now, the excavations were headed up by Alexander Zhabakishvili, who you see here in the photo. And basically, every photo I have of this man, I swear he looks like Popeye. <laughs> now, the excavations revealed five levels of a Neolithic village uh, consisting of circular mud brick structures varying in size between one and four meters in diameter. These were not the most comfortable houses. Uh, also found in the excavations were some carbonized grape seeds that you see here. Uh, and it was because of all this that led Pat McGovern to sample some of the vessels from the excavations, which tentatively produced evidence of tartaric acid, suggesting that wine was produced in the Caucasus and could probably be pushed back in theory to about 5,800. Now I say tentatively because um, to do this properly, you needed to have a, a baseline soil sample to make sure that the tartaric acid that you were identifying in, in the ceramics was not the result of something that had creeped in there from being left in the soil for uh, you know, 8,000 years. And so because of not having the baseline soils, he'd done this analysis in, in the late 90s and this stuff was excavated in the 70s there was always a little asterisk over it. So this leads us to the new research that I'm involved with in conjunction with the government of the Republic of Georgia. It's a, a project known as the Research and Popularization of the Georgian Grape and Wine Culture. It's a little bit of a mouthful. Now, I don't know how much any of you really know about Georgian culture. Georgian, uh, wine is an integral part of Georgian culture, and it pervades it way more than French, Italian, or any other sort of European and Western societies. Basically, the French have nothing on the Georgians. Now, drinking wine is just so embedded in the culture, and in some respects, it's, it, it's really a bit of an endurance sport when you're over there. <laughs> now, the vine and wine permeates Georgian culture, imagery of appears in art and architecture, both modern and ancient. You know, it's deeply tied to the Georgian church. Saint Nino, who's the, port, the, the patron saint who brought Christianity to Georgia, did so with a cross made of grapevines, uh, which continues to be the symbol of the Georgian church today. You can sort of see it on the, uh, well, actually in the, in the top right, I guess it would be, you can see a little cross. I'm sorry, here's a train. A little crucifix of the uh, uh, with, with the Georgian cross. <clears throat> now, Georgian wines are unique in the way that they are traditionally made, known as the Quebri method, named after the clay pot that they're fermented and aged in. Uh, and it's different because the wine is fermented on the must. The, the the skins, the seeds, the stems, everything is thrown into the clay vessel for anywhere between three weeks and eight months. And anybody who's ever made wine before uh, would immediately sort of think that this is insane. But especially when it comes to whites, often enough you have no skin contact whatsoever. You press, you press the grapes out and you just ferment the, the juice itself. Whereas here you're fermenting the skins and the, uh, and, and, and the juice together. Now the Quebri are specialized vessels. They have very distinctive shape. They're often quite large. And they're, well, usually found, but they were always buried in the ground up to their neck. And these characteristics have a special role in their function. One of the key things I sort of identified is that uh, when, you, when you bury this, these vessels in the ground, you fill them with the wine, uh, especially when you have the cooler ground and the warmer air outside, it naturally creates convection currents in the, the vessel. And what this does is it keeps the skins in constant motion and contact with uh, the wine, uh, which adds part of the favor. Usually if you have, have the skins in with the wine, eventually they will sink down to the bottom of the vessel. But because of these convection currents, that uh, will, will take much longer to happen. And that's why these things can sit in the, uh, in the cavities for almost eight months. And if you've you, you, you can't unfortunately get any Quebity wines or it's very difficult to get Quebity wines in Canada. Uh, if you ever get a chance to, they are very unique uh, wine. 
uh, especially the whites, they don't come out as white. They come out as an amber or orange wine, which are slowly becoming all the rage nowadays as people sort of uh, copy and recreate the, uh, the methodology. Now, these cuevities have a long history going back for sure in their traditional shape and format to the 8th century BC. Uh, if you look at the bottom uh, left-hand corner fo uh, photo, you see myself and uh, a, a Georgian archaeologist standing over the, uh, basically it was the wine storage room uh, of, a, uh, of the King's Summer Palace of the Kingdom of Iberia. Uh, <clears throat> now these cuevities go back uh, almost certainly to the Bronze Age uh, and perhaps even the Neolithic. Now, speaking of the Neolithic, given the variety of grapes that are found in the region, uh, well, the reason why we have that many of them is because it's understood that they've been uh, basically domesticated and living and intermixing in the region for a long period of time. So this was a logical place to look for the earliest evidence for the domestication of grapes and the production of wine. And like I said, the excavations have been going on in Georgia for, uh, for a long time under the Soviets. And the Neolithic sites were producing some interesting material. The ceramics, the storage jars, had often images of clusters of grapes. And you can see the one on the bottom left-hand side that's from the site called Kramis di Digora. And basically, it looks like the representation of a jar with a bunch of grapes in it. Uh, and, um, and you're finding uh, other ones where you can see on the, on the top right, and the bottom right is just sort of a drawing of it, but basically little stick figures dancing underneath of what looks like hanging grapes or arbors of grapes. Uh, <clears throat> so also when archeologists began looking at the botanical remains, they were finding the odd carbonized grain seed uh, as well that I showed you in that, in that photo a, a little while back. Um, and uh, unfortunately though, one of the first things we did with the project is we radiocarbon dated basically most of those seeds, and they all basically dated to about the 1800s. They were all intrusive. So we have all this tantalizing evidence of, of wine production in the Neolithic, but the key bit of proof that we had, the grape seeds, was unfortunately uh, modern, and the wine, the residue analysis always had sort of asterisks over it. Um, <laughs> so Yes, uh, the, the, the uh, data from Shulaveri Scotus gave us that telltale residue of wine, but with the asterisks, suggesting that wine can, could perhaps be pushed back to about 5,800. Uh, and the neighboring site, okay, there's Shulaveri, so the neighboring site of Gada Gora, which is slightly younger uh, than, than uh, the, the site of Shulaveri, is the focus of our new work. But I'll come back to that in a little bit. So this project, uh, is funded by the Georgian government through the Department of Agriculture and the National Wine Agency. It's like I said, these guys really take their wine seriously in Georgia. Now, the project is not just archaeology, it's multidisciplinary in nature. We're working with agronomists, DNA specialists, palynologists, paleobotanists, climatologists, and of course, the dirt monkeys. Uh, <laughs> we archaeologists. Now, basically, all of us are working together to understand the antiquity of wine production in Georgia but also the role that Georgia played in the spread of grape varieties that we know today, and also perhaps the spread of wine culture. Now, using, the, using ancient pollen data, uh, a number of viticultural paleoclimate reconstructions for Georgia were developed, basically sh uh, showing a series of maps of the potential growth areas for vines in different time periods. With, uh, basically, they run from the Neolithic to the Middle Ages, and what's interesting for us is the late Calcolithic, so basically the 4,000 4, BC, for the late Calcolithic and early Bronze Age, so 4,000 BC to about 2,000 BC, are the periods that contain the most favorable environmental conditions, essentially the period of maximum grape growth potential. I want you guys to remember this because we'll come back to this in a little bit. The DNA analysis has so far produced some interesting patterns. First, it seems that the Georgian uh, cultivated varieties were crossbred with some species that came from Central Asia. And uh, this resulted in having larger berries and therefore more juice. 
And this seems to have happened sometime about the fifth or fourth millennium. Second, there's this interesting link between Caucasian and East Anatolian cultivars and some modern Western European varieties, specifically the ones that are found in Spain, Portugal, and also North Africa and parts of Syria. The importance, which, the importance of which we'll circle back to at the end of this talk. So please keep this in the back of your mind as well. <clears throat> so the Neolithic period of the Caucasus is represented by an archeological culture that we call the Shulavetish Shomotepe culture. A little bit of a mouthful, but it's basically named after two of the important sites where this culture was first identified. It's found across southeastern Georgia, western Azerbaijan, and northern Armenia, with the greatest concentration being in what's known as the Kvemokartli province uh, of Georgia, where the sites of Gadatrili and Shulaveris are found. And these two sites are the focus of the archaeological component of this larger Georgian project. The component is run as an archaeological field school out of the University of Toronto, started in 2016 under a project that we are calling the Gadatrili Gora Regional Archaeological Project Expedition, or GRAPE, just because I'm much better at acronyms than the Georgians are, it seems. <clears throat> now, the site of Gadatrili Gora, which is the main focus of the excavations, represents a, a, an early Neolithic village, but it's small. We're talking 0.6 hectares in size. Cursory examinations began in 2002, larger excavations began in 2014. Uh, I was asked to join in 2015 and we had our first real sort of season of uh, excavations under grape uh, in, in, in 2016. Uh, and we basically have been going back every summer until well this year, unfortunately, thank you COVID. Now, one of the main aims is to excavate a large portion of the settlements and help preserve it preserve it and develop it into an archaeological park to help develop tourism in the Maranuli region of, of Georgia, because it's a, a fairly impoverished region that definitely doesn't have much in the way of tourist attractions. Uh, <clears throat> the excavations identified two main phases of Neolithic occupation at the site, with hints, hints of a third ephemeral, probably seasonal uh, camp dated to the Chalcolithic and Early Bronze Age period. So the Neolithic phases or horizons each produce three subphases of construction and renovation. So houses start to fall apart. They either kick them down and, and uh, flatten everything out and build up again, or they actually repair the walls and stuff like that. Uh, the structures are circular buildings with the predominance of combining two of the round structures into this sort of figure eight pattern. Uh, the upper phase architecture does appear to have, it appear to be less dense than what's observed in the lower phase two. However, it has larger structures. Uh, some are six plus meters in diameter. Actually, one of them is the largest uh, structure for this culture that has been so far found. How to interpret these changes, of course, is, is unclear and we're sort of debating it amongst ourselves, whether it's the result of changes in family size, organization, increased wealth, changes in social stratification, we, we can go in circles over that. At the same time in 2016, we took, undertook smaller soundings at the neighboring site of Shulaveris Gora, which was basically untouched since the original excavations uh, by, the, by the Georgians in the 70s. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the aims was to obtain soil samples to provide that needed baseline uh, for comparison of McGovern's earlier positive results of, of wine residue but also to get a better picture of the stratigraphy of the site, because unfortunately the way it was published, it was a little confusing. Uh, and we also want to understand the relationship between Shulaveris and Gadashvili. And finally, also, we wanted to find out if there were still more levels or more, more periods of, of occupation that were left to be investigated since uh, uh, the, the Georgian excavations. Uh, we began by having the Slumpton, uh, Slumpton fill from the old excavations removed, uh, which are basically readily visible because you could see the depression in the soil when, when you got to the site. Uh, <clears throat> and then we identified some architecture in the northeast corner is what you're seeing there. <clears throat> the excavations are real four phases of construction in that area, which seem to follow one another in a fairly quick succession. 
Uh, the earliest phase of the wall um, excavated in the test trench was associated with a bin, followed by a later phase of that same wall with a hearth, which I'll circle back a, a little later in this talk. Uh, the west and north bulk showed evidence of significant burning, uh, while most of the western section really was dominated by modern infill of, from the old excavations. Like we literally pulled out a car bumper from the side, which really kind of confused us for a little bit. Uh, on the opposite side of the tell, we opened up a step trench uh, that produced six levels, five of which actually had architecture. And then the sounding sort of stepped off down uh, off the mound itself to see if there was any occupation around the mound, sort of suburbs, if you will. And there actually seems to be a fair bit more. And there's at least another two meters of occupation still to be excavated. Uh, show, so it shows that there's still a lot more to, to uh, find and understand at the site. And occupation at the site really basically uh, uh, continued for almost a thousand years through the sixth millennium, almost uninterrupted, it seems. Sorry, there's the step trench. Now the ceramics, ceramics are of course the bread and butter of the archeologist, but are absolutely boring for anybody who is an archeologist. Uh, <clears throat> what we found at the two sites, it's a, you know, a small corpus of, of diagnostic ceramics. Um, interesting, the, the lower phase of Gadatrili, the, the ones that had the smaller buildings has a lot more ceramics than the level that has the, the bigger buildings. Again, we're not really sure what this means. Uh, <laughs> the ceramics have been analyzed by, well, he used to be a U of T grad student, now he's a postdoc at U of T. Uh, and they're very simple, you know, steep walled pots, narrow bases, often they'll have this sort of basket impression on the bottom because they were, they were made on, on, uh, on weaved, basket weave plates, if you will, or, or mats is the better way of describing it. Uh, applique decoration that you see up there, sort of our clusters of grapes, if you will. Um, consisting of knobs, crescents, uh, and the odd motif like uh, circles or, or serpents uh, have been found, but they're not as common as they were at some of the other sites uh, that were found in the earlier excavations. The faunal, so the animal remains in the lithics are just uh, beginning to be examined by some graduate students here at Toronto. Uh, there is a preponderance of bone tools, uh, basically a lot of bone awls th that are used for piercing leather hides. Uh, scrapers, again, used for cleaning hides. So it seems that, that hide preparation was an important part of this uh, society or their economy, if you will. Uh, and there also is, as you can see down in the middle, down close to the bottom, there was this one very well-preserved bone spoon. It actually was... In, almost intact when we first, when it first came out of the ground, but the Georgian student who found it was very excited and he was running around showing it to everybody. And then he tripped and fell and stepped on it and broke it. You ever want to see a grown archeologist cry? That was one of the moments. Uh, the lithics of so the stone tools are almost uh, entirely made of obsidian. So volca volcanic glass. And again, they're bladelets and all. So a lot of it seems to be for uh, um, leather production or high, high, high preparation, although there are some evidence of making these sort of composite tools like sickles for agricultural uh, activities. Uh, but we have, well, we hope to have more detailed information in, in, in the coming future. But of course, one of the main aims was to find evidence for early wine production, uh, which had again been sub, you know, suggested but never really substantiated by the previous data. Uh, <clears throat> now, the uh, that botanical data, the seeds that, are, that I talked about, like I said, we radiocarbon dated them and they were all dated to the 18th century. We have a very intensive flotation and sampling program. So we basically, we take uh, a sample of, of somewhere around six to eight liters of soil from almost every context. It's brought back to the, to the dig house, to the lab where it is washed and floated to, to get the materials the best way to, to find ancient seeds. Uh, and uh, we have so far only found one seed. Uh, so we still have uh, a little bit of a hole in our, uh, in our data there, but there's other bits of data that began to, to fill those holes. Um, particularly where, we, where the palynologists, the, the, um, uh, <clears throat> the pollen specialists have been uh, working very hard for us. 
no, sorry, there's the seeds. So in collecting soil samples from palynologists, they're able to look in different contexts and they've actually detected large amounts of grape pollen, uh, particularly in a lot of these storage jars. Uh, they would find grape pollen, suggesting that it contains some sort of grape product in these neolithic vessels. As well, you have uh, identification of starches and epidermal cells of grape vines, and also the microscopic hairs of small fruit flies, similar to the ones that, if you know, whenever you have juices outside or fruits that have cracked open, all those tiny little fruit flies that buzz around, they're finding those wings in there. Now, when taken in combination, there's, there are good indicators of the existence of wine having been stored in these Neolithic vessels. If they do the same analysis of modern wines, they find a lot of the same material in there. So this is a lot of help, but it still does not uh, match the level of, uh, of, um, <laughs> of residue analysis. And so we, of course, have collected uh, a, a number of samples, 11 samples, and sent them to, uh, to Patrick McGovern for, for analysis. And we've actually found, gotten positive results of six of the 11 samples uh, that were sent in the very first year. And one of the samples actually produced the highest level for, of tartaric acid Pat McGovern has ever seen. And we're actually lucky. We have a radiocarbon date from a seed that was found basically centimeters from one of one of the vessels from the sites of Shulaveres Gora, which gives us a date of a, between 5985 and 5805, suggesting that grapes are being collected and processed into a secondary product, in this case, an alcoholic beverage of wine, probably as early as 6000 BC. Uh, these results were published in uh, November of 2017 in the Proceedings of, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, you might have seen it because we got a little bit of press over, uh, over it. Uh, it was found all over the world. We actually even made it into the Guinness Book of World Records, which was an interesting um, plus, if you will. We anticipate some further discoveries. In the, in the coming years. We actually have another first that is just about ready to go out. Uh, we seem to also have the world's uh, oldest evidence of the use of honey. If you remember that uh, from, from the excavations, that first area in Shulaveres Gora where we had that hearth and the bin that really sounded kind of uh, not, not so important, we actually were finding a lot of evidence from the palynological data of honey being in there. So it seems that they were using honey in some sort of cooking uh, at the site, probably for sort of a bread or something like that. So we hope that you will see more of us in the future. Now the results of this larger project have also been highlighted at an exhibit at the Museum of Wine in Bordeaux, France. Uh, again, in sort of the, the, the summer and fall of 2017. It does, uh, well, as the first sort of traveling exhibit to the new, to the new museum in Bordeaux. We have been trying, with the help of the Georgian ambassador to Canada, as well as the Canadian ambassador to Turkey in, in Georgia, to bring this exhibit to a number of cities in Canada and the US, but it has been incredibly frustrating how we have gotten zero interest from any of uh, the museums, especially here in Toronto. Uh, you would think that the archaeology of wine would be something of interest, but uh, apparently not, especially not to the ROM. So another aim of this project, and I sort of alluded to this earlier, is to, uh, is to excavate a large portion of the project and help preserve it and develop into an archaeological park. Uh, sorry, train. Uh, one of the immediate aims is to construct a roof over the site at Garachuli to help preserve the, the remains for the visitors to see, and that way we can take the tarps off of it. Right now, if you do not come when we are excavating, there basically is nothing to see. Uh, unfortunately, the, well, the roof was supposed to start construction last uh, April, but then COVID hit, and that has now put everything on hold uh, for a while, I imagine. We'll just have to wait to see what happens when we can get back. There we go. There we go. So we have enough evidence to show that wine was developed in Caucasia about the sixth millennium BC. The interesting question is then how did it spread across the ancient world? And to that we have an interesting possibility, I believe. And then also the question is what effect would it have had on the other great cultures of the Middle East that were around at the time? 
So the fourth millennium saw, uh, saw the development of urbanism and, orga and organized long distance trade in the Middle East. Uh, it's one of these periods that most people don't really know enough about, but it really is a fascinating one. It's, if you're looking for the roots of our Western civilization, it starts here at, at, in the fourth millennium. Uh, and so you, you have, my apologies, uh, urbanism and long distance trade. And you have trade routes that are basically, there we go, uh, linking Southern Mesopotamia with Iran and Eastern Anatolia. That site at Godin Tepe that I talked about at the beginning of the class, this was part of that trading system. And at the same time in the Caucasus, we see that the eventually the development of one of the uh, most widespread and longest lasting and most poorly known cultures in Near Eastern archeology, span what's known as the Kura Araxes culture or the KAC. Uh, this culture is distinguished by its highly recognizable, very distinct ceramics. It's this handmade, almost heavily burnished, almost always heavily burnished, frequently decorated in this red and black color combination. So the black will be on the outside, the red is on the inside and it's kind of spilling over the the lid, if you will. Uh, and it often has this sort of ribbing decoration that you see here. By, th by the third millennium, this culture is basically found in this giant blob that you see on the map, the giant pink blob. Uh, it co basically covers a, a large part of the Middle East. Uh, this map is actually old. This is from my older research. I actually should have updated this one. Uh, there, there's about 600 sites bearing this culture that have been found uh, in the Near East. And actually the updated map now has 1,460, I believe, or, or, or 54, something like that. There's an incredible number of sites bearing this culture found all across the Near East. Uh, and this, this culture, well, most importantly, it lasts so long, but it lasts as an independent culture, but living alongside others. So they, they, have, they, 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 they don't just come in and take over an area. They, they live side by side with the indigenous people. And they do so for an incredible amount of time, anywhere between well, 1,000 to, to 400 years. That, when you think about it, that's just absolutely amazing. Now, for the sake of time, I can't go into the evidence that shows that the Kuroxes uh, were producing wine. Uh, but what the data suggests is that everywhere the Kuroxes went into, they seem to set up the symbiotic relation with the locals, relationship with the locals. And what I believe is part of this relationship is creating these little viticultural villages on the outskirts of the major centers. And there they produce wine in this sort of closed shop industry for the growing, the growing elites in these regions. We have to keep in mind is that wine is a finite commodity uh, with only a limited amount that's, been, that's able to be made every year. And it usually at, in these early dates won't really last longer than a year, giving it sort of a high status. But because it can, more can be made the next year, it's also renewable. So <laughs> therefore it would have been a powerful and important little industry to control in the ancient world. Okay, so we have evidence for the Kuroxes cultures having something to do with wine production. What effect does this have on them and the indigenous cultures of the regions that they migrate into? Now in uh, the Yamuk Plains that have been in southern Turkey, basically right on the Syrian border, uh, <laughs> where University of Toronto actually is, has been working, this is the other project that I work on, we've been working there for 20 years now. Uh, but the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago and Robert Braidwood, who is perhaps one of the earliest famous uh, archaeologists of, um, of, uh, of Near Eastern archaeology, he was, he's basically he was the man that Indiana Jones was modeled after, uh, is, actually provides some of the evidence for a perfect test case to see how the Kuroxes could have affected um, the local cultures. Interestingly enough, though, we won't actually look at the data from Tel Taina, but we'll look at the data from the British excavations at the site of Tel Achana, which is literally quite way to, right across the street from, uh, from Tainat. And so this is what you're looking at here. So on the, on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see a, a satellite image, uh, image of Tainat in the top. That's where Toronto works. And then Achana, which was dug by uh, the great Sir Leonard Woolley, 
uh, in the 1930s, basically at the same time that Chicago was excavating. And the photo on the right just gives you an idea of the scale of excavations, excavations in these early days, just the hundreds of people that they had working. And <laughs> the data the data comes out of there gives us a really good uh, idea of what's going on. So the level four, which is really sort of the, the, the late Bronze Age, so 18th century BC. Uh, at this point, the city of, uh, of Alalakh, which is found at Achana, was the capital of this small kingdom called Mukish, which was a vassal of the, uh, the, the bigger kingdom of Yamhad, which was basically centered on Aleppo. Uh, now, in the excavations, they uncovered a palace, and the palace had a whole slew of tablets that were found there. And they give us a lot of data about uh, the settlements of the kingdom, what's known as the, the Allah census list. Essentially, it was basically a way of them to track the, the number of households and their production so that they could tax them properly. Even 4,000 years ago, they had to tax everybody. So the Allah census list records the number of houses uh, uh, in all the different settlements. They tell us that each household had one iku or 0.63 hectares of vines. So if you can estimate the number of households, you can then identify the amount of vineyards. And this is some work that actually uh, an OI graduate student did uh, quite a long time ago, I guess, uh, where he looked and he said, okay, the, there are uh, the small sites based on the number of houses in the text they can, they can have 19 hectares of vines. The medium-sized sites can produce 31 hectares of vines, and the large sites, 95 hectares of vines. Now, using uh, contemporary texts from central Anatolia, from the Kingdom of the Hittites, where they actually give us information about how, how much wine can come from a single iku of, of, um, of vineyard, our, our 19 hectares of vines could produce 11,400 liters of wine. Our medium-sized sites uh, can produce 18,600 liters of wines, and our big cities can produce 50, uh, sorry, 570, no, sorry, 57,000 liters of wine. Now the texts record 80 small sites, 10 medium, and three large. What that boils down to, if you do the math, 1.269 million liters of wine a year, or 1.69 1 modern 750 milliliter bottles of wine. This is 4,000 years ago, ladies and gentlemen, and this is one small kingdom in the Middle East, basically a nothing kingdom in the Middle East. So this is the Middle Bronze Age. How can this compare to the early Bronze Age, so the 500 years beforehand when the Kuroxes were around? Well, if you overlay the settlement patterns where the Kuroxes were living and where the cities from the kingdom of Mukish are found, you can basically estimate that the Kuroxes were, had the potential to create an equal or maybe even more wine than they were making in the, in, the, in the late Bronze Age. And so the idea is that these guys were living in these small farmsteads outside of the big cities, on the outskirts, if you will, of, of the, of the uh, locals, and they were producing this needed a co commodity by, by the, well, growing elites, if you will. And it's this basically closed shop, independent uh, life that they were leading is what allowed them to preserve their culture for so, for so long. Why these guys can, li can live alongside foreigners and keep their culture for an insanely long period of time. Uh, and actually, if you want, just a, as a little bit of, uh, a parallel, if you will, on the left-hand side, you can see a grape press that was found in our excavations at Tai Not, which dates to the early Bronze Age. So more evidence that they're making wine in, in the early Bronze Age period. So what effect, so this is the Kuroxi's culture. What, what effect could they have had on the locals? Well, if you look again, we come back to the wonderful ceramics that the archaeologists love so much. Uh, when you look at it, uh, the fourth millennium sees the, the tail end of the fourth millennium, I should say, sees the introduction of the Kuroxis people into the region. And with it, they bring a wine kit, basically the, the vessels that are, uh, that are done, that are, that are created for drinking, mixing, serving wine. It's very typical in their, in their ceramic repertoire, but when you look at the locals, 
they don't have anything like that. They have, they really literally don't have any cups for, for drinking things. They would usually drink out of larger bowls or maybe something out of wood, nothing really out of ceramic. After the introduction of the Koroxis people, you start to see the locals actually having drinking bowls and they're stylized on the shapes that the Koroxis have. In the following, once we move into the early Bronze II and III period, we see an explosion of drinking paraphernalia that shows up in the local ceramics. Uh, bowls, or sorry, bowls, cu cups, goblets, uh, jugs for, for, for pouring and serving. Uh, interestingly enough, at the beginning in this EB II and III period, they seem to be found only in sort of the elite context. Once you move into the following the EB IV period, drinking vessels are found throughout all levels of society. The use of, of drinking is, uh, or drinking has spread throughout all levels of society. <clears throat> but how can we say that they're actually drinking wine? What about beer? You know, we are, after all, extensively in Northern Mesopotamia. You know, Greek tradition holds that Dion Dionysus, the god of wine, visited Mesopotamia once and only once, and basically ran away never to return because they had no wine for him to drink. Couldn't stand the place. In, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, in Tablet 2, beer is described as lot, the lot of the land of Mesopotamia. And it's actually one of the aspects of civilization that tames Enkidu. The Enuma Elish speaks of drinks being, drinking beer through straws. And you have scenes that you can see here that show up in art where people are drinking beer from straws. On the right-hand side, you have actually a silver beer straw that was found in the royal tomb of Ur. Uh, and as sort of a parallel here you have from Western Africa, some Kiriki men sitting around a pot in the ground that had beer and they're all siphoning it out through straws. Uh, so drinking beer through straws is found in all forms of art in Mesopotamian culture. But if you actually look close enough, you see, well, them drinking out of cups as well. Now it's long been suggested what they're drinking is actually a, a form of date wine, but since we know that wine was coming into Mesopotamia already by 4000 BC through the uh, Uruk trading system, there's a good chance that they were actually drinking grape wine. Where is it? And actually Sumerian, the, the, the oldest language in the Mes Mesopotamian world and Akkadian, they actually had a, wine for, a word for grape wine going all the way back to sort of almost 4000 BC. Uh, that's what you're looking at here in the top left. You have the Sumerian word geshtin, which will eventually become karanu. Geshtin, basically that triangle with the uh, plug on top, which has often been suggested might represent a cluster of grapes. So this is southern Mesopotamia in, in, in Iraq in the third millennium. And wine is drunk, but it seems to be not so common. What's happening in northern Mesopotamia, northern Iraq and Syria? It's a much different story. In northwestern Syria, in the later part of the third millennium, uh, it's dominated by this kingdom called Ebla, uh, modern Tel Mardik. Again, it's near the uh, modern town of Aleppo. More important for us, it's actually very close to that, to the Amuk, uh, to Tainat, where we were just talking about with our Koraxi settlement. By the mid-third millennium, we actually have extensive written records that start to document trade in wine. The texts from Ebla reveal that wine is purchased and traded by the palace coming in from the surrounding fields, as well as from further afield, from the, the Euphrates region. And what I would suggest is that, what the, what the, what the tablets tell us is that over time, the control of the of wine production becomes more centralized by the palace. And first uh, by the regional centers and then eventually by Ebla itself. And what I would suggest is that what happens is as this centralization happens, the wine production is taken out of the hands of our little independent Kuroxi's uh, winemakers and robbed of this economic niche that they have, they lose their cultural cohesion, the ability to stay distinct for that long period of time. And they will eventually slowly fade into the cultural background. The second millennium is really important for wine as it really sort of becomes cemented as a common beverage for all. Uh, the city of Mari on the Euphrates near the modern Syrian Iraqi border becomes this major trading depot and redistributor of wine, sending shipments to Sippar, which is near modern Baghdad. The texts there talk of gifts of wine coming to and from other kings stored in large 
uh, wine storerooms called Kanum in the palace. And detailed tablets talk of wine traders coming from the north and the west, from, from Carchemish and, uh, and the Euphrates region, but also from Aleppo and areas further east, all bringing their wares to Mari. Moreover, the text really shows how profitable the trade in wine could be, with one shekel of silver buying six jars of wine equal to about 180 liters or 47 gallons uh, in, in Carchemish. Uh, then when it comes to Mare, those same six jars sell for two and a half shekels. And when those jars are sent down to, uh, to Sippar, they sell for four shekels. So the wine trade could be really quite profitable. And when you think of the volume of wine that we were talking about from, uh, from, <coughs> uh, from Alalak, it's, an inc it's incredible how much is going around there. Up in the Euphrates, we have sites like Titrus Huke, which are again, these large urban centers and Titrus even had uh, suburbs. And in the suburbs, a large number of the houses actually had wine presses. It seems even though it's controlled by the city, production seems to be highly decentralized with individual houses, each pressing wine, which would then presumably would have been collected by the city center and then sent out to Carchemish and then on to places like Ebla and Mari. So, summing it up, if you will, the sixth millennium sees the birth of Vita and Vita culture in the Near Eastern world, particularly in, in Caucasia. The fourth millennium, it seems that wine is one of the commodities that's being traded from Iran, from southeastern Anatolia, down into the Mesopotamian heartland. The third and second millennium see a similar pattern, but with more centralization and, and distribution by palaces like Ebla in the early Bronze Age and Mari of the second. And wine will become more common throughout the second millennium, but, but really only in the north. Uh, it doesn't really so become so pervasive in society in the south. Production of, will, of course, hit its peak in the Iron Age around 1000 BC. It's at this point the Phoenicians, who are basically from the North Levantine world and are essentially a continuation of the Bronze Age civilizations of Ebla and Mari. These, uh, these guys become the major wine producers and traders. Their ships ply the Mediterranean filled with Phoenician wine amphora, and their wine is made from grapes that appear to bear direct genetic lines to the grapes from the Caucasus in East Anatolia, what's known as Vitis Vinifera Pontica. But they also establish wine industries in places like Sicily, Sardinia, North Africa, Spain, and Portugal, which if you remember back to the beginning of the talk, parallels nicely with our genetic data emerging from our studies. Perhaps we're looking at varieties that were brought from Caucasia, initially perhaps by our Kururaxis migrants into Syro-Mesopotamia that continue in th to thrive and survive in, uh, into the Iron Age. And they're then transported across the Mediterranean by the Phoenicians. And we're seeing that genetic echo even today. At the same time as the Phoenicians, uh, in the west and the east, we have the Assyrians, who are the, the, the big bag boogeymen of, of the Near East at this time. They're the, the major power. And wine in the rest of Syria Mesopotamia becomes sort of a common beverage. Under the Assyrians, wine is a major tribute item coming from places like Gilzanu, so the Lake Van area, and from Unki, from the Amuk, from the Achana and Tainat area. Give you an idea of the numbers that we're talking about for the commemoration of the capital city of Kalhu, so modern Nimrud. Uh, the Assyrian king Ashurnasipal II demanded 10,000 skins of wine just for the housewarming party alone. Uh, the central parts of, of northern Syria, the Habur and the Balikh, become major wine produ production centers. They basically create canals to bring water in uh, to an otherwise desolate region, and it becomes filled with, with vineyards. And gardens and, and uh, are found all around the Assyrian capitals and they're all filled with, with uh, vines that you can see in these photos. Uh, images of drinking or attendants holding sticks that are laden down with big heavy grapes <coughs> are, uh, are, are permeate Assyrian art. And perhaps my favorite is the one on the, the top hand right where you have King Ashurbanipal and his Queen Ashursharat who are basically sitting there what seems to be uh, almost a, the, the first sort of symposia, if you will, See the Greeks, Greeks, another thing that the Greeks did not invent, if you will, uh, drinking wine out of little bowls that look very much like our Kuroxes bowls, uh, unknowing that they, very much like, like us today, are enjoying a legacy of people out of the Caucasus. 
So in closing, I and Grape would like to thank all our hardworking team who's made all these remarkable achievements uh, possible. Of course, our sponsors, the University of Toronto, uh, Woodsworth College, um, Georgian National Museum, the Ministry of Culture, Ministry of Agriculture of the Republic of Georgia, and the Georgian National Wine Agency, and also the Wine, the so Georgian National Wine Association. Again, these guys take their wine very seriously. Uh, and our friends at the Embassy of Georgia to Canada, and most especially the Ministry of, of Culture of Monuments and Protections for providing us with our permission to conduct our research. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very